So as CTO at Greenpeace International, our next speaker is responsible for visualizing how technology can be used responsibly to increase impact in a rapidly transforming environment. And her TED talk on why a free and fair internet is more vital than ever has had over 2 million views. Please welcome to the stage Priscilla Chomba. Picture this, five-year-old me in the small mining town of Mofulera in Zambia, pestering my sister for the time. Last I checked, she said it was 1645, but we're playing outside, so she's under strict instructions to make sure that at 17 hours, she must tell me no matter what. And the reason is simple, because at exactly 17 hours, or 5 p.m., if you will, the TVs came to life and you got to watch Sesame Street or The Muppet Show. But if you missed it, then you had to wait until the show that comes next week. Because you see, before 17 hours, when you switched on the TV, you got these vertical lines. I don't know how many of you are old, to rem old enough to remember those. And they were like yellow, maybe like green, light blue. I don't remember. But if you're too young to know what I'm talking about, you can Google it, and somebody will have an image for you on the internet or maybe even a video. And so my point is, if you told five-year-old me and my sister, or my parents and neighbors, that within their lifetime, they would be able to watch any show, anytime, anywhere on a device this small. They would have nodded and smiled politely while really thinking you need to get checked. But you see, technology has advanced rapidly, and we can now, it's now changed the way we watch shows, the way we listen to music, the way we drive, even the way we turn on the lights in our homes. But I think most importantly, it's changed the way we connect and the way we talk about issues that are important to us on a global scale. We've seen the power of technology used to bring together millions of people around the world, some of whom don't even speak the same language. And I take you back, but we saw the Me Too movements force conversations that otherwise wouldn't happen in those rooms that they were happening in. We saw protests around the Black Lives Matter movements from places like South Korea to the US to South Africa and beyond. And I think that shows us that technology can bring together everybody to discuss the important issues of our time. And the climate crisis is definitely one of the most important issues of our time. So I really wonder why we're not seeing everybody rallying around that cause in that way. What if we could find a way for everybody to connect and have those conversations? Because according to the IPCC, we have less than seven years before Earth becomes really difficult to live on. And this year alone, we have seen wildfires in North America, floods in Southern Africa, and even the double tragedy of floods and fires in places like Greece. What if we could connect somebody in Greece to somebody in Canada what if climate movements in Africa can connect with those in Southeast Asia to have these conversations? What if those activists could be equipped with enough data and enough technologies to give them the confidence that they need to challenge power in an effective way? I think we stand to benefit quite a lot. And you see, even though we continue to have these conversations in small spaces, the real power really lies with the corporations and with the lawmakers and with the governments. I want to make a proposition today. But before I do that, I want you to think about some of these platforms that we're talking about connecting people. Because while technology gives us the opportunity to do good, to do positive things, it also is what I like to call a double-edged sword. It can also do the opposite. And right now, for example, the social media platforms we have, they are really on the other side of the double-edged sword. We're seeing misinformation, disinformation, as just was being discussed. And we're also seeing a wanton disregard for sustainability by some of these companies that are providing these platforms. And unfortunately, people don't really have very many options because getting off one platform, say I choose to take a stand and get off one platform, might mean I have to get off two others because this one big company that I want to get off went and bought these two. And so I'm stuck 
especially if I'm a business and I need those platforms for customer acquisition or maybe customer retention. This is a very difficult place to be in as a business because very soon, if not already, your customers and maybe even your staff are going to start questioning why you're spending their money on these platforms whose values and ethics don't resonate with you. And so the first proposition I have today is that we need to start thinking about how we invest in those small, those new platforms that are ethical, that are value-based. Those platforms that are being built by people so passionate about the environment that they will not sell out in the name of profits. I know this is very difficult to do, and I know you're probably thinking this might come at a cost, but I believe it's a cost that we have to pay. Because without these, very soon you will be losing business because your customers will be questioning this. And I know in those MBA classes we were told that the whole point of a business is to maximize shareholder value, but maybe it's time we rethink what the metrics for that shareholder value is that maybe saving the planet is as important as financial profit, and we need to find a balance. We know that money must be made, and everybody wants to make money in this economy, but there has to be a way to find a balance between making money, but also making sure that we have an earth on which we can live in time. And so I would have loved my second proposition to be that we, you know, reinvent and come up with a new economic model, but I know that's a very big conversation and I can see a few of you showing a bit of panic that I'm going to talk about this and it will take the whole day. So I'll leave that for another time. For now, I'll go back to what I was talking about, the double-edged sword of technology, and go to data centers and cl cloud computing. Because you see, for every new trick that technology accords us and every new opportunity that we take, we also have to realize that in the background, it could be contributing to the lack of sustainability, that we could be using data centers that are not using renewable sources of energy, and that because these organizations are prioritizing profit over people and planet, they make sure that it's really the cost of the environment, the cost to the environment is really invisible to us as users. And so we need to find ways to make sure that there's data, that there's more information that businesses can use, that lawmakers can use, that consumers can see to demand accountability from these organizations. Good data has really been far and few between, and we've really struggled to make some of these companies report. And even when they do report, and transparency has increased in the last decade or so, the methodologies and the scope being used are so different that it's really hard to have accurate data. But what if we could use data-driven and data-based and evidence-based um, metrics to drive change and inspire these organizations to do better? Greenpeace, in about 2009, started to look at the technology sector broadly and measure sort of the, um, the carbon emissions they were producing, what their sustainability goals were. And that really helped push some way, but we still have a lot that don't do this. And so using evidence-based approaches, we were able to influence some technology giants to make sure that they're using 100% renewable energy, or at least they have targets to do that. But what we've seen is that there are still many that won't be influenced no matter what we do. And so we made a choice. We stepped away from working with some of those companies. We just said, if you won't make the efforts that need to be made to save the planet, we won't work with you. And so my second proposition today is what if you could use your organization's influence to apply pressure on these organizations to change? I know it's expensive, but I really want you to think about it and think about if a cohort of businesses came and said, We've looked at the data, we've looked at your plans, you're not doing enough and we won't give you our money. Maybe, just maybe, we can make a little bit more of a change. And maybe if they started reporting, because we're demanding it, maybe we could get them to do a bit more and we could maybe empower the consumers to also demand better and we could empower lawmakers who sometimes really want to make the right decisions but don't have enough information to do so. 
And it's not just technology companies that I'm talking about when I talk about influencing. Recently, we saw Hyundai in the Amazon make a commitment to stop supplying the heavy machinery that was being used for illegal mining there. This was only possible through the use of data from satellite imagery, through the community leaders in those indigenous communities and their leadership, and through area flyovers that showed, that led to a report that then put pressure on Hyundai to make this commitment. Now, I don't know if you noticed, I'm a techie and I'm a data person, but in this entire conversation with you, I have not used data and I have not used statistics. That has been very deliberate because I want to emphasize that data is just data. Data is very important, but data without putting people at the center really doesn't get you very far in your quest to inspire change. Because you see the work of Greenpeace Brazil and Greenpeace Asia with all the data, all the satellite image analysis and everything would have meant nothing without the leadership of the indigenous communities. And so on that note, I want to make my third proposition, which is that we start to listen to those communities most impacted by climate change and that we start to make sure we understand how we can support the movements that they're leading and that we don't sit with our data and think we know it best because they've been at this for a lot longer, they're feeling the impacts, and therefore they know some of the smaller pieces that we might not be thinking about, some of the bigger ideas that we might not be thinking about. I have worked with some of these communities and the enthusiasm, the drive, the energy that they bring is unmatched from Senegal to Zambia to Nigeria, to Bangladesh, Mexico, name it, these people rally and bring everyone in their communities along. They are able to translate the big English, I call it the big English that we use in the climate movement, and put it in a language that their own communities understand. They are able to sit with the elders in their communities and listen to the indigenous knowledge that allowed them to coexist with nature in a healthy way for a really long time and start to reapply some of those principles. But it's really bittersweet for somebody like me to watch these especially young people really fight for their survival and for their planet. Because between you and me, we know that they and their communities contributed very little to this crisis. But they are scrambling for their lives. They are scrambling for survival. While the big corporations, the fossil fuel industries, the technology giants and other industries that we all know are polluting, and the countries that benefit from them continue to do far less than they should. They continue to ignore the science, and when they do look at the science, they try and find a simple way out that doesn't require them to make the effort. We've seen these governments ignoring calls for moratoriums on deep sea mining. People have finished destroying the earth and we're in a crisis and we now want to move to the deep sea and mine there, we don't even know what chaos we will unleash when we go into that. And the reason being given is that we need the critical minerals found in the deep sea for a green transition and that we need these minerals to power our EV batteries. But we also know that these are the exact same minerals used in military hardware and there is no guarantee that that isn't what will be prioritized. I will stop there because this topic is very personal to me. Uh, but given the weekend that was and the fact that nobody rested, we were all refreshing our feeds or listening to the news because OpenAI and then Microsoft decided to keep us all entertained, I would be remiss in not mentioning that I think the conversations around AI should also focus on, p on the planet. We're talking about the values, the ethics, putting guardrails in place, and I think we can't talk about values and ethics without talking about the environment. And so really thinking through the environmental cost of AI and the future of AI, I am a great believer in the potential of AI to help us solve some of humanity's grand challenges, but that's only useful if humanity have a livable planet. And so I will stop here because the clock is counting down and take you back to my three propositions. The first one, who remembers the first one? 
or was I just kind of speaking to myself? The first proposition that I made, and this is me now trying to remember, because I know there were three. The first proposition that I made was that we invest in alternative platforms that are green, that are ethical, that are value-based, and that give us an alternative to what we have right now. My second proposition, again, I'm looking around the audience for ideas on what the second proposition was. I don't remember the second one either. But I know the third one. The third one was us making sure. No, I remember the second one now. The second one was that your organizations use their influence to make sure that corporations that are polluting are held to account. And the third one was that we work with communities to make sure we understand how we learn from them, how we support their movements. And so I will leave you with one proposition, which is that you think about what you can do to inspire change especially given that we're in a climate crisis and that technology can either be a part of the problem or a force for good. Thank you.